Good afternoon. Um, welcome to our event today. This is Understanding Commercial Insurance Policies for Places of Worship. My name is Patty Dorn, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's event. I want to remind you that this event is being recorded. Please keep your cameras off and your mics muted. We will have a question and answer session at the end after all the speakers have finished. If at any point during the event today you have a question, please enter that question into the chat box, and then we will get to that question during the Q&A session at the end. When you use the chat box, please make sure that your questions are addressed to everyone in the chat. Commercial insurance policies for places of worship are insurance policies designed to protect the unique buildings and the unique liability risks places of worship face. The wind blows, rain falls, and pipes burst, just like with our own homes and our own lives, places of worship face risks. We often don't think a lot about insurance until something goes wrong, but having a policy that is designed to protect the unique risks of your organization is important. We do understand that the prospect of being responsible for making insurance decisions can be intimidating. You don't need to be an insurance expert to properly protect your buildings and the unique liability risks that you face. But knowing the questions to ask and working with an insurance producer that you trust is key. And this is so you and others in your organization can focus on your ministry. Today, we are grateful to have with us presenters from the Maryland Insurance Administration, FEMA Region 3 Mitigation, FEMA Region 3 Recovery, the Department of Homeland Security Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. The Small Business Administration was not able to join us today, but their slides about SBA loans will be available with the other slides when this event is posted on our website later. And with that, I'd now like to introduce Marcus Coleman, Director of Homeland Security Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships for an introduction to this event. Welcome, Director Coleman. Thank you very much, Ms. Dorn, and thank you everyone for joining the call today. My name is Marcus Coleman, and I have the esteemed pleasure, and it looks like we do have our Small Business Administration uh, Senior Advisor on the line with us, and so they'll be able to present. Um, but it's my esteemed pleasure on behalf of the FEMA Administrator, uh, Deanne Criswell, uh, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, and the Executive Director for the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships um, to, to say just thank you uh, for having this very important discussion. I uh, want to give a, a special word of thanks uh, to our colleagues in FEMA Region 3 and to the leadership of uh, Ad Administrator uh, Peach and the Maryland Insurance Administration uh, for hosting what is a very critical conversation. Um, we know, of course, uh, throughout the state of Maryland, like many places across the country, uh, disasters can strike at any minute. And when a disaster impacts a non-government organization or a place of worship, um, you know, that, that, that really helps, to, it shakes up the community. And we wanna make sure that part of the reason why we came together today for our faith and community partners is to outline the different options uh, to support you as you work to support others. Uh, we know many of you may be connected to networks of facilities across the state, um, from the, the Catholics to the United Methodists, uh, other Protestant or multi-faith organizations. And while one of the options is FEMA assistance, public assistance, which you'll hear a little bit about, um, and there's also options available from the Small Business Administration uh, across the board, our encouragement is to really think about uh, what your unique needs are from a holistic perspective and that you do the best that you can in consultation with your insurance policy holder uh, to think about, right? How to make sure that you're best covered. We know post natural disasters, uh, the, 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 the best way and the quickest way uh, to help any organization or home get back on their feet is insurance. And, and it's one of the reasons why I'm especially grateful to have a champion in the Maryland Insurance Administration uh, to really work with faith and community based organizations uh, to understand their options on how to think about insurance policies from those disasters ranging from a tornado uh, to flood, which of course acquires additional insurance in addition to your regular insurance, uh, to other hazards that we may face, earthquakes, right? There we face a lot of other things that have happened. And so 
Um, again, just grateful for the conversation here today. I'd say that this is very much for our office and for the agency, uh, a, a start of a new chapter for really having a conversation about risk and understanding risk, uh, which is a key pillar of the FEMA strategic plan. And it, it's what, what better way to start this new chapter uh, than when the wonderful state of Maryland um, and our faith and community partners along with Region 3 uh, to help drive new conversations to encourage our faith community, our community-based organizations, uh, to make sure that folks are adequately insured, uh, that they understand their options for disaster assistance post-disaster for their facilities and their communities, and that we continue to do our best together uh, to help build out a more resilient uh, Maryland and a more resilient nation. Uh, Ms. Dorn, I'll pass it back over to you. Thanks so much, Dr. Coleman. So we're gonna get started with the presentation part of the program. As a reminder, please use the chat box to ask questions. You are encouraged to ask questions um, as the speakers are speaking and we'll get to them during the Q&A. Just please make sure that those questions are directed. So first up, Mary Jo Rogers of the Maryland Insurance Administration. She's gonna be talking to us about commercial insurance policies for places of worship. Welcome, Mary Jo. Joyce, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. I can't hear Mary Jo. Okay, just waiting to see where she is. Um, okay. You there? There you are. Nope. Okay, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to discuss and provide information on insurance for places of worship. Next slide. As a reminder, this presentation does not provide legal advice. You should discuss specific questions with your trusted financial advisor or insurance producer. First off, let me explain what is the Maryland Insurance Administration. The Maryland Insurance Administration, MIA, is the state agency that regulates insurance in Maryland. The MIA license, licenses insurers and insurance producers, that would be agents or brokers, examines the business practices of licensees to ensure compliance, monitors solvency of insurers, reviews and approves insurance policy forms, reviews insurance rates to ensure rates are not inadequate, excessive, or unfairly discriminatory, and investigates consumer and provider complaints and allegations of fraud. So let's talk about insuring places of worship which present unique risks. Unique building structures have unique insurance needs. Places of worship are often large ornate buildings with large and complex roof structures. Places of worship often house unique and valuable items like stained glass, pews, organs, and many others. Places of worship often house preschools, elementary schools, daycare centers, and food pantries. You may host community meetings and other events designed to welcome and serve the public. With the kindness of opening your doors to your community comes risk, such as injury to volunteers who may not be particularly skilled for a task or injury to visitors, an increased theft risk, or potential accidental damage to property. Each organization must take time to carefully consider its own risks. 
So let's talk about common parts of the commercial policy. Generally, there's gonna be two parts. The first part is gonna be building and business personal property coverage. And the second part is gonna be liability insurance coverage. Let's also talk about what is a peril. A peril is a cause of loss. Your building and business personal property coverage is designed to protect you from loss due to covered perils. Policies may be of the named peril type. That would include fire, windstorm, hail, vandalism, theft, etc. Or the open perils type coverage for all causes of loss, unless the cause of loss is, is specifically excluded, or it could be a combination of both. Certain peril, perils rarely are covered under a standard insurance policy, and that includes flood, earth movement, mudslide, and earthquake. <clears throat> So building and business personal property coverage. The building is building and items permanently attached to the building. It can be other structures on the property. It can be completed additions, signage, glass windows and their protective coverings, including stained glass, sound equipment and fixtures. It may include permanently installed machinery and property such as steeples and pews, outdoor furniture, appliances, personal effects owned by clergy, the clergy residence, if rendered uninhabitable from a covered peril, may receive benefits for additional living expenses. These would include increased cost of meals, perhaps temporary housing, such as a hotel. We cover newly acquired buildings or newly constructed and personal property for 180 days may be available. Business personal property of your officers, trustees, church heads, and employees at or away from the premises. Your particular policy may or not may not include all of these standard items, and it may include others. It's important to thoroughly read and understand your policy and work closely with an insurance producer, again, your agent or broker, to make sure your policy needs are met. The second part is liability insurance coverage, and this is protection from claims of injury or property damage caused by your negligence. General liability coverage may be available for staff, church members, and or volunteers. And other liability coverages to consider, ministers and pastors liability, which will cover clergy and church leadership, employment practices liability, such as wrongful termination and other employment issues, directors, officers, and trustees liability, religious freedom liability, which is protection from discrimination suits, sexual misconduct liability, church activities off premise liability, daycare and preschool liability. Carefully consider the activities of your unique place of worship and the associated risks with your trusted insurance professional. Now let's go over some of the general exclusions and policy limitations. These risks, which I'm going to list, are generally excluded though they may be purchased either separately as a separate insurance policy or as an endorsement. Flood coverage. While some policies offer private flood insurance coverage, you generally will need to purchase coverage for flood insurance separately. Employment practices, foreign travel, 
money and securities, animals, costs of excavations and grading, piers and docks, underground pipes, and costs to research, replace, and restore information on papers and documents. Vehicles, structures or personal belongings not owned by church or clergy, wear and tear, boilers except due to explosion, building ordinance coverage, earthquake, mudslide, war and military action, loss of use, business income during loss of use of the building, including rent and school tuition. In general, many of the separate parts of your commercial insurance policy for your place of worship will have separate coverage limits. For example, you may have $100,000 for clergy personal property and then have $5,000 in coverage for your signage. Make sure you review the limits and to make sure that they meet your organization's needs. There are some other protections you may want to consider, such as commercial auto insurance for places of worship owned and are non-owned vehicles, workers' compensation, umbrella insurance, active shooter, cybersecurity insurance, coverage for accounts receivable records. And these are these would be for money owed to your organization and unrecoverable because of loss or damage to your accounts receivable records, coverage for fine art, private structures such as used as dwellings, but not parsonage units, and theft, vandalism, and rewards for information. It is also recommended that you pay attention to your deductibles. Your insurance company will pay only that part of the loss over the deductible amount stated on the declarations page for any one occurrence. So it's important to pay close to the deductibles you choose. Now I will add your declarations page is included upon inception of the insurance policy and at each renewal. So it's important to review it not only when you first obtain the coverage, but at each renewal period. Your policy may include more than one deductible. It's important to understand your deductible or deductibles and when they apply. If an insurer isn't offering a de deductible or deductibles that you consider to be manageable by your organization, you should consider shopping around and obtaining quotes from other insurers for the same coverages. If your policy includes a deductible that is written as a percentage, make sure you understand when this deductible applies and how much this will cost your organization. So how do I get started? First, I would speak to places of worship for insurance agent and broker recommendations. Many insurers will visit your place of worship in an effort to help you understand your insurance needs and may offer ideas about how to maintain your building and lowering, lowering your insurance risk, which can ultimately save you premium dollars. They may have ideas about large maintenance issues or smaller ones like stairwell lighting. They may be able to help you understand how to make the activities you provide safer for your staff, volunteers, and your guests, and help you understand the value of items your organization owns. Ultimately, you are looking to purchase enough insurance to put your organization back to its original position should an occurrence happen. 
but not more insurance than you need. Instead of thinking about the lowest premium, ask your producer to go through every one of the coverages line by line available to the place of worship so you are certain you end up with exactly the insurance company that will properly protect your organization. So final note, your commercial insurance policy for your place of worship includes a duty to notify the insurer when you are first aware of a potential claim. Report all potential claims to your insurer or insurance producer as soon as possible. For property damage claims, mitigating your losses early is key. Contact the insurance company, agent, or broker as soon as possible. Now, this is a commercial policy place of worship checklist, and I believe this will be available um, after this um, presentation. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thanks so much. And yes, that checklist is going to um, to be available for you. It will be posted on our website along with the other documents. Um, Joyce, can you go back to that real quick? Looks like it's separated into three parts. We have property insurance, um, the building and, and business personal property coverage. And then we have some questions to talk to agent, broker, the insurance company, but you're probably going to be working closely with an agent or a broker. So we have the property insurance questions that you can focus on, general liability, and then some specialized coverage and additional policies to consider. And so we do recommend, um, you know, when you're working with that agent or broker, uh, maybe download, print this out, and hopefully this will be a useful resource for you. And uh, with that, we are going to move on to our next speaker. Next up is Bill Bradfield. He is a flood insurance outreach specialist from FEMA Region 3, and he's going to be giving us a brief overview of flood insurance for places of worship. Welcome, Bill. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's a very important topic. So, uh, so I wanted to start off real quick with saying, you know, why should you consider flood insurance? Well, um, as we've seen routinely, flooding can happen just about anywhere it rains or snows. Um, you know, Maryland is no stranger to flooding. Um, and, you know, as the big storms or the big events tend to get the most press, we also see a, a tremendous amount of uh, nuisance flooding or, you know, thunderstorms that just sit over an area for a little bit and may locally impact you. So, um, you know, it, it's not just a coastal issue or being along a river or creek. Everyone should consider flood insurance. Um, you know, most properties are vulnerable. Uh, on the average, we've seen about 40% of national flood insurance program, uh, flood insurance claims are outside of these high risk areas. High risk being those would be the uh, what they consider the uh, regulatory floodplain, or we don't really use the term much, uh, but the hundred year floodplain. We try to get away from the hundred year because people think, oh, I've already had a hundred year flood, I'm good for the next night. Um, but we're seeing increased claims outside of these uh, the traditional floodplains. Uh, so it's important to not just think that, oh, I'm out, I'm, I'm okay. Um, why is flood insurance also important? Well, as we just saw too, uh, you know, most standard insurance uh, does not cover flood damage. Um, it, you know, it's a separate policy. Uh, it's a lesson that unfortunately um, most folks find out too late in the process um, after they've experienced the flood. Um, you know, they think that they're covered by other uh, policy, uh, but it's but they're not. Um, and it just kind of adds on to the grief that they're already feeling. And, you know, especially when we're talking about, you know, houses of worship, important places for the community, um, especially after experiencing a flooding event, when they're looking for that sense of community or looking for the resources um, or just need to get grounded, um, the importance of those places, you know, and making sure that you can help also be more resilient and rebound. Um, I did want to mention that um, you know, the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, just went through a pretty significant uh, rebuild overhaul um, after about 50 years. Uh, it's called Risk Rating 2.0 Equity in Action. I'll spare everyone the details. 
Um, but one of the nice things about this is that it has made, made policies, um, purchasing policies more equitable than ever and easier when you're working with your agent. And I'll talk about that in, in a couple of seconds. Uh, but I did want to promote that because uh, under the older, what we call the legacy system, uh, you'd have to collect your information, go sit down with an agent and present that to them. They would have to send it off uh, to get a, you know, with the information to get a rating um, and then come back to you. Now with the new ratings engine, you can sit down with the agent, work with them. Uh, they should be able to fill out the information, pop it off into uh, the ratings engine um, and you can get a quote in about as little as 20 minutes. So that way it can help you kind of play around, figure out what works for you, but in a much more time sensitive fashion. Okay. So how much can you buy? Well, what we're looking at here is for non-residential structures, the limits for a national flood insurance program are $500,000 for the building and $500,000 for the contents. Um, I do want to point out, you know, we're talking about the national flood insurance program because that's the one that's overseen by FEMA. Uh, there is also private insurance out there. Um, so that's something you'd want to talk with your agent to, uh, you know, maybe you could get a rating or, you know, look for quotes under both. Um, to see, you know, if one is, you know, more affordable, offers a little bit different coverage, that's fine. Our biggest message is be insured against the risk. We're not, you know, we're promoting flood insurance. We're not trying to drive folks to the NFIP or private. We just want folks to consider flood insurance. Um, do want to make sure that you're aware that contents and building coverage are purchased separately and there are separate deductibles. Um, and you talk about that with the agent um, to see what the coverages are. Um, you know, but unless you have the contents coverage, flood damage belongings are not necessarily covered. So you want to make sure that you're looking at both of those. Usually when we're looking at the building, we're talking about the physical structure itself, the foundation, uh, mechanicals and equipment um, being rolled up under the building. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so if you do have any questions about flood insurance, and I realize this has been a pretty high level overview, um, you know, go to your agent. I, that's the best resource we can say. If you have any questions, speak with them. Um, as I mentioned, the new rating process can provide a quote in as little as 20 minutes. Uh, so, you know, it makes it easier. You're not going to send it off and sit around and wait for something to come back. So it gives you that flexibility uh, to reach out and, and just kind of and maybe play with the numbers, uh, see if you can find something that, uh, that fits your needs. Um, but I also wanted to provide some information in general on the NFIP. Um, the NFIP website is www.floodsmart.gov. Uh, a ton of resources right there. If you have just general questions, if you want to just kind of take a look real quick, um, it, you know, it, do your homework before you meet with your agent. Um, strongly recommend floodsmart.gov. Um, if you do have any general questions about flood insurance, or if you have questions about the flood maps, um, you know, we recommend contacting the NFIP Help Center right there. Um, they are a wealth of knowledge uh, and uh, can answer just about, you know, most general questions, um, you know, as related to flood insurance, map, you know, flood mapping, those things. Um, and if you do have an existing NFIP policy, uh, there's the direct customer care number there to reach out to them, and they can speak on a little higher level detail about policy specific questions if you already have a policy. Okay. So here's the contact information for Region 3. It's myself and Rich Sabota. Um, we are here to help. Uh, we have a great relationship with the Maryland Insurance Administration. Uh, we're, you know, they are very proactive doing a lot of outreach. Um, it's, it's great to see how much emphasis they put on the importance of flood insurance. Um, and we'd just love to continue working in that relationship. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out at any time um, and we can do our best to help you. That's uh, it. Thanks so much, Bill. Sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, next up today, talking to us about the FEMA Public Assistance Program. Welcome, Amanda Fall of the FEMA Region 3 Maryland Integration Team. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about public assistance, which is actually a program that has to be sort of turned on, so to speak, with the declaration by the president of a presidentially declared disaster. Um, it's 
name can be a little bit confusing because public makes people think sometimes that it's for the general public. Um, and public assistance is actually there to support communities recovery through providing assistance to um, governments and private nonprofits of which houses of worship um, are, are one of the private nonprofits that we do support in public assistance. Um, so again, it supports communities recoveries by providing them with monetary assistance for debris removal, um, life-saving emergency protective measures, and then restoring the public infrastructure, including roads, um, bridges, um, buildings, uh, the you know electrical grid, that type of repair. Um, it is a reimbursement program um, based on eligible expenses. Next slide. Um, so we have four layers of eligibility. The first thing we always do is we look at whether the applicant is eligible. Um, like I said, only sort of governments, tribes, um, and nonprofits are usually eligible for this. And then we look at whether the facility that was damaged is eligible and then whether the work that was done to restore the facility is eligible, and then whether the specific costs were reasonable and necessary and eligible as well. Um, this does have some uh, impact on houses of worship um, because a lot of times your various types of facilities will fall into different categories in FEMA, and I'll cover that a little bit later in my presentation. Next slide. Um, so in order for a facility to be eligible, it needs to be located in the designated disaster area. Um, if a disaster is declared in, you know, Harford County and your facility is in Howard County, um, your facility would not be an eligible facility. It has to have been damaged by the declared disaster during the incident period, so it couldn't have been damaged previously or after the disaster is already over, and it must be in active use and open to the general public at the time of the disaster. Next. So this is what I was getting into about sort of the different types of facilities. A lot of private nonprofits, including I'm assuming a lot of your private nonprofits operate multiple facilities um, that sort of serve different purposes um, or a single facility that is composed of more than one building. And we do have to evaluate each building independently even if they're all located on the same grounds. Um, some PNPs provide service facilities that have both eligible and ineligible services that happen in them. Um, and we consider those to be mixed use facilities. Um, so the eligibility of those is we look at the amount of physical space dedicated to each type of service. Um, the primary use will be the one that more than 50% of the physical space is dedicated to. Um, if more than 50% of the physical space is dedicated to an eligible activity, then the entire facility is eligible. Um, but we do prorate the funding based on the percentage of physical space that was dedicated to um, eligible services. Next. So we also divide for um, private nonprofits facilities into critical facilities and non-critical facilities. Both are eligible under our program, but there is a little bit of um, an extra step that non-critical facilities have to go through. Um, so critical facilities that we frequently will see um, some religious organizations have um, would be education, either primary or secondary education, um, and then higher education with some limitations that I won't go into right now just because it's a little bit um, too long for this presentation. And the non-critical facilities that um, religious applicants typically will have as well is community centers, houses of worship, some child care, food assistance programs. Um, so again, all of these are eligible. It's just there's an additional step non-critical facilities have to go through. Next. Okay, so this has a sort of flow chart um, that you guys can sort of walk through to see if a facility would be considered um, critical versus non-critical. Um, the main difference between them is if a facility is viewed as a non-critical facility, you do have to apply for an SBA loan prior to coming to FEMA, and FEMA will only cover the permanent work costs that an SBA loan would not cover. Um, if it is a critical facility, this step is not necessary, um, and FEMA covers the permanent work as long as it's otherwise eligible. Um, if the private nonprofit misses the SBA application deadline, um, then the funding is not, the work is not eligible for FEMA public assistance. And if they decline the SBA loan, then our funding is limited to the cost that the loan would have otherwise not covered. Um, so again, for the non-critical facilities, it is really important in public, public assistance 
that the private nonprofits made sure that they apply for that SBA loan by the deadline listed in order to still be eligible for FEMA funding for um, whatever is left or if they are denied the loan. Next. And then ineligible facilities that we sometimes see um, religious organizations have as well um, would be conference centers. Um, we see sometimes, and then administrative and support buildings that are essential to the operation of the non-critical services are also not eligible facilities. So again, we have to look at each of the facilities separately and determine on a facility level whether the facility is eligible or not for public assistance. Next. And then eligible work. Um, again, once we've determined that the facility is eligible, the work needs to be because of the disaster. It needs to be located within the disaster area. It has to be your legal responsibility to conduct that work. Um, and it has to be not covered by insurance or another federal agency. Next. Which brings me to the role of insurance, which I know is the main uh, subject of this talk today. Um, so FEMA is not allowed to provide public assistance funding that duplicates any insurance proceeds. So we will reduce eligible costs by the amount of actual insurance proceeds if the applicant knows what those are, or the anticipated insurance proceeds based on the applicant's insurance policy. Um, and then in the end, when we're closing out the grant, we would adjust in that point, in that spot to, to make it so that it was what you had actually received, not just what the anticipated insurance proceeds were. Um, and we do require an applicant to take reasonable efforts to pursue claims to recover their insurance proceeds prior to us giving public assistance funding. Um, so again, we do sometimes limit funding if the insurance policy would have provided coverage, but the applicant just chose not to attempt to um, get that money from the insurance company. Next. And that was all of my slides. I know that was like a whirlwind. Public assistance can be kind of a complicated program, um, but I tried to sort of focus on the nuances of how it sometimes affects uh, houses of worship for eligibility purposes. Um, my contact information is not on the slide, but I am happy to provide it to anybody that wants it if they have additional questions for public insurance or public assistance. And now I'll turn it back to you, Patricia. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, if you want to put that contact information in the chat, uh, that would be great. And so next up with us, this is our last presenter today. We have Warren Miller from the Small Business Administration, and he's going to speak to us about SBA loans. Welcome, Warren. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Good. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to share this information. As you all have seen, uh, SBA, uh, we work in collaboration uh, with FEMA when declarations uh, take place. So there are some intricacies of, of uh, how we work and requirements that they have in funding. But uh, with the opportunity, I first would like to, on behalf of uh, our administrator, Ms. Isabella Consuelo Guzman, who is a member of the president Biden's cabinet and the voice for 33 million small businesses uh, uh, provide leadership in this space. So I want to extend greetings on behalf of uh, uh, Ms. Guzman. I uh, would like to share with you all, as you see, our mission statement, the Office of Disaster Assistance. Our focus is to connect individuals, businesses, private nonprofit organizations with small business uh, disaster assistance, uh, our programs, to assist with uh, recovery, uh, preparedness, as well as mitigation. Uh, one of the things uh, is often uh, mentioned about with regards to our faith partners are recognized, uh, as you heard the, the previous presenter, or recognized as private nonprofits. So you'll see that referenced uh, in, in our presentation. Next slide. Uh, this is talking about preparedness. Uh, this is a, a, one of the things that we're often uh, urging and, and, and encouraging uh, survivors with regards to preparedness is uh, the topics around communications plans, uh, understanding the importance of uh, being able to connect with the local emergency management, the systems, the alerts. So having from a faith standpoint, the understanding before disasters uh, happen, those relationships, 
uh, things that we're encouraging with regards to uh, insurance and uh, recovery pieces, making sure that they take their vital uh, information systems, records and things and upload those into other areas or aspects such as we hear about the cloud uh, from a standpoint when disasters happen. And uh, additionally, uh, ensuring that they have the adequate insurance coverage, uh, knowing what your uh, deductibles are, what your inventory is, uh, the types of things that's uh, covered, uh, basically doing an insurance checkup. So those are things that we are offer, often encouraging as a part of uh, preparedness uh, with regards to our faith uh, community. Next slide, please. Uh, we've, we're talking about uh, the SBA disaster assistance. Uh, the SBA, as a result of uh, the, the disaster piece, uh, many may not be familiar with, we do not give out grants. Uh, our efforts are, are basically low interest loans. Uh, annually, uh, the SBA, uh, with regards to the approved loans, uh, gives out billions of federally secured dollars in low interest loans uh, for long-term disaster uh, recovery. As you look at, uh, we talk in terms of real estate, uh, personal property, uh, machinery, uh, and our emergency injury, uh, injury uh, is working capital. So if there is uh, a disaster that's caused uh, with regards to payroll or other things, uh, those loans can be considered for assisting uh, with those uh, requirements. Next slide, please. Uh, I, as I mentioned, uh, this is looking at from a historical standpoint, uh, looking at the billions of dollars over the years. As you look at, uh, uh, we just got our numbers uh, uh, published. We were at $1.96 billion for fiscal year 2002 that we had dealing with uh, physical uh, disaster events that the SBA was able to fund uh, this uh, last year. Uh, we're beginning the new quarter uh, as we speak. Next slide, please. Uh, types of disaster loans uh, and the limits, as you can see, uh, I, I mentioned uh, earlier with regards to the, the private nonprofit uh, area, our business loans, uh, can go up to dealing with the repair or replace of real estate, inventory, uh, physical stuff for declared events, up to $2 million. Uh, with regards to the economic injury types of loans uh, for the small businesses and private nonprofit, uh, working capital loans can go up to $2 million. And recognizing that the congregates uh, in our faith community, uh, homeowners, uh, we do have the ability for and, and urge and encourage that they apply for the loan, even if they choose not to take the loans, but they can, uh, uh, those loans can go up to $200,000 with consideration of a replacement of personal property in the amount of up to $40,000. Those loans uh, can cover things such as insurance deductibles, uh, the refinancing of existing mortgages, uh, the payment of mitigation or protective uh, upgrades, uh, also the consideration of relocating to safer or lower risk areas. Uh, these are low fixed interest loans that can be amortized uh, up to 30 years to help with uh, low monthly payments that can make uh, the recovery effort uh, from a consideration of affordable uh, recovery uh, efforts. Next slide, please. As mentioned, these loans are backed by the uh, federal government, which allows for low interest. These, are, these rates are set quarterly, but uh, the topic we're talking about today is uh, looking at for private nonprofit. Those interest rates are at 1.875. And if you think about with regards to the terms of that low interest rate for 30 years uh, and the consideration of not having to wait for insurance, as mentioned earlier, 
those adjustments could be made with regards to if it's insured, but applying for that loan, uh, being able to get the loan and looking at making whatever adjustments, this is a very affordable and attractive uh, low interest rate. Next slide, please. Uh, we talk about uh, mitigation. Uh, these are considerations with regards to uh, if one wanted to look at the additional uh, consideration of the uh, mitigation, if you look at the amounts, adding uh, that small the percentage uh, could additionally allow for a very nominal uh, piece to make those adjustments for mitigation. We think in terms of if you were looking at uh, 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 generators or uh, the, the types of shingles or safe rooms or things like that, or, or things that the mitigation piece uh, could be taken in consideration of, uh, of uh, your, in addition to the loan that you might take out. Next slide, please. Our loans, as we mentioned, these are loans and not grants. Uh, with, re with regards to consideration of the loan approval, uh, those determinations of, as mentioned, applying for the loans, uh, they have to be for declared areas. Uh, basically, the credit worthiness or the determination for the affordability uh, to repay those loans and looking at uh, if there are areas that flood insurance uh, the ins or hazard insurance requirements or stipulations that uh, our loans uh, would require consideration. Next slide, please. As mentioned, uh, we uh, when declarations happen, uh, our organization, we participate with FEMA and disaster recovery centers, as well as uh, we may set up uh, separate what we identify as business recovery centers uh, that uh, could be considered uh, outside of the disaster recovery centers. They may stay, uh, tend to stay open longer. They may be in other areas other than where disaster recovery centers uh, happen, but when the disasters happen during that application process, uh, we we encourage for people to apply for the loans. If you make a determination that you choose not to take the loan, you don't have to take the loan, but because of the attractive rates, we do encourage that uh, individuals apply for the loan. Uh, with the loan, there are, uh, as mentioned, the property verification going out doing uh, the inspections, the assessments of uh, that this is in a uh, disaster area and the specific uh, uh, assessment of that particular property going and moving through the loan process upon a loan being closed. Uh, we look at basically doing disbursements uh, in a very quick uh, time frame, and then the, the additional disbursements or uh, schedule as a part of uh, whatever your your loan amount is so there there are schedules uh, that are are made uh, that allows for in the event that you've got insurance and there are adjustments that need to be taken in consideration that those things can be adjusted uh, accordingly but you could move forward with your recovery piece uh, looking at the uh, disaster loan next slide please and just summary, uh, the, the declaration piece, as I was just mentioning, uh, the SBA uh, loans, uh, when approved, uh, can be dispersed. Uh, even if you've got insurance, these loans can be dispersed. Uh, they're not a duplication of benefits. So uh, with that, there will be the consideration that if you were able to receive your insurance later on, that loan amount could be adjusted uh, with regards to the funds. Uh, to cover, as I mentioned, uh, being able to cover insurance deductibles, uh, possibilities of refinancing existing mortgages, uh, as well as I mentioned to you about the mitigation and protective uh, considerations. Uh, these are low interest rates, uh, as we mentioned and we showed you earlier on, that can help with the repair or replacement of disaster losses that uh, uh, from a declared disaster. Uh, at the, as you can see, the disasterassistance.gov uh, is uh, is one of the ways that you can go about applying, uh, be it online, uh, going to a disaster recovery center, or interfacing uh, with those individuals that might be in local communities when disasters are, are happen 
to assist individuals with uh, covering, uh, recovering from a disaster event. Next slide, please. Uh, this is information with regards to uh, reaching uh, that can be shared to, for individuals to reach out uh, for assistance uh, with regards to SBA's disaster loan program. I think that's the last slide. Thank you so much, Lauren. And thank you for the opportunity to share the information. So uh, Lauren was our last speaker today. With that, we're gonna move on to the Q&A section. Um, if the speaker panel wouldn't mind turning their cameras on and joining me for the Q&A, thank you. And I also, um, we have um, a representative from the MIA here, Ron Coleman as well, who um, may be available to answer additional questions. So thanks Ron for being here. I have uh, two questions in the chat right now, I believe. The first one, can we apply for, low, for a loan for removal of trees that fall from a storm? Oh, Warren, you're muted. Uh, I would, uh, that is a question that I, I, I'll need to get. I'm going to be taking that it was going to be with physical damage to uh, property, uh, but I, I, I let me get an answer to that. So that one is unique. But right now, I think the immediacy is going to be dealing with uh, physical. As I showed in there, those items are your physical property, real estate, and what have you. Thanks, um, Sarita. If you uh, want to send me your contact information so I can get it over to Warren, I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat right now. All right. The next question, can an organization get a mitigation loan by itself or does it need to be part of a disaster loan? It has to be a part of a disaster loan. So it uh, should be a declared event. And uh, the mitigation piece, this is a, a policy thing that we are addressing right now. So it's related to the, if it's a, a hurricane, then it has to be hurricane cause. We're looking at right now, obviously mitigation to prevent or minimize. But right now, the way the policy is written is that it is a declared event and it would be additional to a uh, disaster loan uh, that we would be approving uh, related to the recovery. Thank you. Hey, Patricia, yeah. real quick. Yeah. Can I just uh, dovetail into there real quick? <laughs> um, yeah, um, I am not uh, a grant specialist, but I also wanted to make note of a couple of ha hazard mitigation grant opportunities that are out there just for your awareness um, that could help. Um, within FEMA, we have two types of hazard mitigation grants, both disaster and non-disaster. So basically, if, uh, if the level of damage reaches the threshold of uh, presidentially declared disaster, that makes the hazard mitigation grant program uh, available, um, which is, you know, as its name is, is a grant, there's usually a local cost share um, aspect of it, but the uh, what we call the HMGP or hazard mitigation grant program would be eligible to use for mitigation activities. Um, and then also on the non-disaster side, these do not require a presidentially declared disaster. Um, they are usually annually. Um, the first one is the Flood Mitigation Assistance, um, FMA grant. Uh, that one uh, is available to homeowners and businesses. Uh, the qualification there may, uh, essentially requires NFIP policy though. So I just wanna mention that one. Um, and also there's a relatively new grant out there, maybe you've heard of it, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities or BRIC grant. Um, that's when I uh, was beginning a lot of public um, press and uh, you're increasing the funding there. So I just wanna make those, uh, you know, make you aware of those. Uh, if you do have questions about them, I suggest that you contact your local or state hazard mitigation folks um, to inquire about um, the grants uh, in Maryland, that would be the Department of Emergency Management, MDEM, um, and they can help out. But if you have trouble finding a contact, you know, reach out to us and we can kind of put you in touch with them if you're interested in a grant. Thanks. Thanks, Warren. 
questions. So um, the next question, I don't know if there's going to be anyone on the panel who wants to take it. Is it recommended that paid admin staff be bonded? Um, yeah, I, sorry, Mark, I don't know that there's anyone on the panel that's going to be able to answer that question today. The next question, can a community development corporation buy a policy for a disadvantaged church building we want to protect? Um, anybody want to take that question? Um, I'm not certain and I may have to get back to them, but they, you can only generally, and Ron can correct me if he knows of anything else, but generally you cannot insure something unless you own it. So you can't insure even in an, even in an effort to assist a disadvantaged group, um, a non-owner of that property can insure it. They must have an insurable interest in order to purchase insurance. Kind of the, the quick answer there. Thanks so much, Mary Jo. Um, Ruthann, if you want to follow up on that, um, if you have more questions, feel free to shoot me an email and, and I'll get it to the right person. Uh, with that, um, I don't have any more questions. We have officially two minutes left. We might go over by just a couple minutes because I um, I will say if you have more questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. But the speaker panel, does anyone have any last words before we close today? All right. Seeing none and um, seeing no more questions from the Q&A, then uh, I just want to thank all the speakers for being here today. Also, all the Zoom participants as well. Thank you. Um, you're going to see a short survey at the end of this presentation. And I just want to say, if you want to sign up for emails for upcoming events from the MIA, you can do that at our website at insurance.maryland.gov. Um, in that case, you would click on the newsletter graphic and you would scroll down to the bottom of the page to sign up. So, um, you know, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Um, those of you who joined, I, I hope you learned a lot today. It was a great speaker panel. And uh, just thank you everyone again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much.